The Borderlands games are already packed to the brim with content. From a main storyline that spans throughout the game, to end game raid bosses that require skill and planning to beat, and also spending all your hard earned money at Moxie's bar. There's so many things to do, but what if you're craving more content? Well, that's where the DLCs come in. And recently, I decided to play through every Borderlands DLC in order to see which ones are the best. I'll also be telling you whether these DLCs are worth playing in 2024. I'll be ranking these DLCs on a list from worst to best, and after each game's rating, I'll let you know if the DLC is worth playing entirely or maybe just a few parts of it. But let's start off with some ground rules on what I'm going to cover in this video. First off, the DLC must have a main quest or storyline that spans throughout it. This means I'm not going to rate any of the Circle of Slaughter maps, but there is an exception with Moxie's Underdome. And if you're wondering why, it's because Moxie's Underdome was advertised as a main DLC for Borderlands 1, and it technically has a questline that spans through the multiple different arenas, unlike the Circle of Slaughter maps where it's just one arena. I also won't be covering any DLCs from Wonderlands because I'm only covering the main Borderlands franchise. I also won't be rating the DLC characters because you can't really play through the DLC characters. Well, other than Krieg, but we'll talk about him later. Secondly, I won't be doing every single side quest and finding every little easter egg in all of these DLCs. One, because that would take way too long, but mostly I want to see how these DLCs feel through one playthrough. And lastly, I'm not a true diehard Borderlands nerd, so I don't care if the Scarlet DLC has the North Fleet, I don't care if there's the Grog, Nozzle, and Tina's DLC, I'm rating these DLCs based on how fun they were to play. By the way, all of the footage you're going to be seeing in this video was streamed live on my Twitch channel. I'm currently cooking up some special events, so if you guys don't want to miss any of those, drop a follow at the Twitch link down in the description. And if you don't have a Twitch account or you're just too lazy to click down below, make sure to subscribe and like the video instead. And in case you missed it, I also played through every single Borderlands game in one stream, so if you guys are interested in that video, click right here. With that being said, grab some snacks, be prepared for some hot takes, and let's get right into the list. My first husband was a dirtbag and a cheat. Starting off with the worst DLC in Borderlands history, we have Mad Moxie's Underdome Riot. Yeah, this one was a rough one to play. While fighting endless mobs wasn't really the issue here, my main problem with this DLC was how tedious every single wave felt. The enemies were so spaced out from each other which made each wave feel so long. There were also 5 rounds for each wave, with 5 waves for each area. The one redeeming factor for this DLC was that it gave us Moxie, but even she wasn't enough to make up for the sluggish gameplay I forced myself to sit through for 2 hours. If you're thinking of passing time, then I guess this DLC is slightly better than sitting and watching paint dry. But if you want to play something to have fun, then stay away from this DLC at all costs. Up next, we have our first Headhunter DLC on the list from Borderlands 2. If you don't know what a Headhunter is, it's like a mini DLC with one mission where you unlock special cosmetic heads for completing them. I wasn't a fan of this Headhunter. I think the TK Baja dialogue was just okay, but I honestly enjoyed the two different boss fights as well. It added this new candy drop, but other than that, this DLC didn't really excite me as much as the others. I'd say this DLC is worth the playthrough if you're a Halloween fan, but if you're not, then you're not missing out on too much. In all honesty, I didn't think this DLC was bad. I actually really enjoyed it. So you may be asking, then why put it so far down the list? Well, I just didn't think it was as fun as the other Headhunters. The final felt felt a little underwhelming, but everything else about this DLC was pretty cool though, like making a love potion and fighting a giant golden robot. I still think this DLC is worth a playthrough though. The dialogue between Moxie and Ellie is amazing, and overall, I had a blast while playing through it. Danger! Excitement! Moustaches! It's time for another episode of Vault Hunter Adventures, featuring Sir Hammerlock! In this place, we have the first main quest DLC of the list. Hammerlock's big hunt has us entering the swamps of Pandora, exploring for lost Hyperion loot while fighting off creatures and savages guarding the crashed ship. I absolutely hated this DLC. I think the overall atmosphere was super dry, and the enemies overall just weren't that fun to fight. I also wasn't a huge fan of Nakayama as a character, but I will admit that it was fun to see him fall down the steps, and that's how the fight ends. I also think the final fight in the main quest line was absolutely terrible, and whoever designed it was probably off the galaxy gas. I'd honestly say this DLC's only redeeming factor is the two raid bosses that show up at the end. If that's something you're interested in, then suffering through a playthrough won't be that bad. These fights single-handedly saved Hammerlock's big hunt from getting a lower spot on the list. But overall, I'd only recommend playing this DLC if you want to fight the endgame bosses. ...noble direction of the Atlas Corporation. But there were those that sought to disrupt our perfect existence. Thieves and murderers. 
perverts and scoundrels. The Crimson Lance, led by General Knox, launch an army to Pandora to take control of the land. The Vault Hunters head out to stop whatever Knox has planned and steal the weapons locked in Knox's vault. Going into this DLC, I honestly was expecting a lot more. I remember hearing some people talk about it and saying it was good, and even the movie has a female version of Knox. While I did really enjoy Knox as a character, the DLC just felt like a massive driving simulator. However, I really enjoyed the final loot room as it truly felt like a massive reward after completing the DLC, and it really captured the vibe of raiding an armory for weapons. In 2024, I'd honestly say this DLC is worth a playthrough. If you look past the driving for hours and hours, I'd say the Nox dialogue, the endgame loot room, and the Chromorax boss fight, the first ever raid boss in Borderlands history, are all reasons why you should play this DLC. Here we have the Christmas themed headhunter for Borderlands 2. Marcus's shipment of guns has gone missing and he tells us to search the town of Gingerton in order to find them. I absolutely love this DLC. It was fun fighting snowmen and the final boss just reminds me of the evil snowman from Wizard 101. It was also cool to see the loot train at the end and overall they definitely nailed the festive vibe for this DLC. I highly recommend playing through this because what other game allows you to take down a giant snowman using guns? Okay, I know what you're thinking. No way this dude put the Waddle Gobbler DLC over the other ones. Well, the fact of the matter is, I did. Torg invites us to Gluttony Gulch where we poison an invulnerable Waddle Gobbler, then take it down. I really enjoyed the Torg dialogue throughout this headhunter, and I also enjoyed the final fight at the end. It was also really cool to see different tributes from different parts of Pandora. I think this headhunter is worth playing through at least once. I don't see myself going back to play through it again, however, I really enjoyed my playthrough of this DLC. That's a vibe. No. Yes. Probably a lot of it. You're adopted. Damn! Up next on the list, we have the first ever DLC in Borderlands history. This DLC allows you to fight through the undead in the Borderlands universe. Even though this is the first DLC in the Borderlands franchise, it found a way to stand out from the others. Fighting zombies as Lilith was unmatched, and the fake credit scene at the end actually got me. This DLC is a maybe on the playthrough meter. If you want to play it, use it as a basis to see where Borderlands has evolved from. I honestly think they nailed the zombie atmosphere of this DLC well, but since it is the first one ever made, there are a lot of missing factors that are present in the future DLCs. Here we have all the different areas that Director's Cut for Borderlands 3 added, and the Mysteriously Your questline. Ava starts a podcast talking about the paranormal mysteries happening in the universe, and it's up to us to help solve them. There's even an added raid boss at the end, which helps add to its rating on the list. I'm probably the number one Ava hater, but I actually enjoyed her dialogue in this add-on. It's one of the few times that I can actually stand her humor, and I think the whole premise also set up what we might see in Borderlands 4. I'd say this is worth a play from the raid boss alone. The Mysteriously Your questline isn't the most memorable as it does have a lot of dry parts, but it might help you see the direction of where they'd want to take Ava and the next Borderlands games. He looked around and didn't like what he saw. Claptrap's been subjugated, humiliated, obliterated. What we call programming, he called slavery. As my top rated Borderlands 1 DLC, I honestly really like the premise of this add-on. This DLC shows the uprising of the Claptrap units and how they seek to fight back against the humans. I really enjoyed fighting Claptraps and I think the whole ending sequence is really unique. I also found it cool that you're fighting the same bosses over again, but they were revived by Claptrap and used as a weapon. I know some people might find that repetitive, but I think it worked really well considering this DLC was made over 14 years ago. This DLC is worth a run through if you're a Claptrap fan like I am, but if you're not, then you won't be missing too much. Borderlands 3 introduces us to a new type of add-on in terms of the takedown. These DLCs make you fight your way through a massive horde of enemies, progressing through the map until you're met with two different boss fights. Each takedown has a boss fight in the middle and a boss fight at the end. I'd say between the two, this was the weaker one. While it was easier than the next one we'll talk about later, I hated the invincibility phases of the Valkyries. It just slowed down the pace overall. I really liked the mechanics of Wotan, and I also loved how his little brain skedaddles around until you shoot it and make loot explode everywhere. If you're a true Borderlands fanatic, run this takedown on true takedown mode to feel the full difficulty. But if you're a casual enjoyer, then one time at normal difficulty is enough to enjoy this DLC at full capacity. 
Just like the previous entry, this is also a takedown map. This map has us fight through hordes of Viridians and is a better takedown in my opinion. Not only is it harder, it just nails the fight for your life feeling that a takedown should have. Seeing endless amounts of enemies flood through portals as you charge up crystals makes it feel like every single shot matters. It was a whole lot of fun to play and I really hope they bring back takedowns from Borderlands 4. This one is definitely harder than the last takedown, so I'd only play it if you think you're ready and prepared enough for a fight. I definitely recommend recommend it if you're looking for a good challenge. Oh crap. The Captain Scarlet DLC has the Vault Hunters searching for Captain Blade's lost treasure of the sands. We meet Captain Scarlet, a pirate queen who works with us to find this vault of loot. Near the end of this DLC, she turns on us, and after taking down her, we take down the Leviathan and claim the loot for ourselves. I thought this DLC was really good in terms of characters and story overall. However, I felt that every environment looked the same, and there were a lot of driving from point A to point B. The areas where you are fighting, however, were super fun. This DLC is around the middle of my list because I feel like it's the true neutral of all DLCs. It has two raid bosses at the end, the quest line was fun, and the environment felt good. This is also the point where we start to lock in and talk about some of the more memorable DLCs in Borderlands history. I'd recommend Captain Scarlet to new players. Overall, this DLC is very enjoyable, and the Hyperius fight on its own is worth playing this whole DLC for. This headhunter is the beach episode of Borderlands 2. We head to Wham Bam Island with Sir Hammerlock as he gets taken by the son of Cromorax, the raid boss from the General Knox DLC. This DLC surpasses the other headhunters in my opinion. I just love the colors of this DLC, and the character interactions between Lilith, Mordecai, and Brick are so funny to listen to. They even made the glitch spot I did in the Nox DLC canon in the Borderlands universe. I 100% encourage you to play through this headhunter. It's short, sweet, and you can even play Ceridium to fight Cromorax again. At this point, everything else from now until the end of the video are DLC packs I encourage you to play through. These DLCs stand out from the others and should be the standard of future DLC packs in the Borderlands franchise. I won't be giving a play or don't play rating from this point on because you should play all of them in their entirety. That's the charm! We can hunt ravenous beasts across the tundra! Guns, Love, and Tentacles is the first Borderlands 3 main DLC that we'll be talking about in this video. You're invited to Wainwright and Jacob's wedding, but not everything is what it seems. In this remote area, we discover that there is a cult in Xylorgos that worships a dead monster, and they get a hold of Wainwright. It is up to us in order to break the curse laid upon him. The atmosphere in this DLC is absolutely insane. The final boss fight literally takes place in the heart of the monster, and the soundtrack is just a chef's kiss. While it is the weakest of the Borderlands 3 DLCs, it still stands so far apart from everything else we talked about on this list. Okay, hear me out. I'm placing Torg's Campaign of Carnage high up on this list because of how well they nail Torg's character. This DLC perfectly encapsulates the character and I had to give it bonus points because it also features Boxy's Bar with a brand new slot machine. This slot machine also takes a brand new currency introduced in this DLC called Torg Tokens. I also love the interactions between Tina and Torg and the Pyro Pete boss fight is one of the most iconic raid bosses in Borderlands history. While this DLC is 90% mobbing, I just feel like the high intensity of Torg makes it feel less dull in a weird way. Uh, Jack's dead, <laughs> but he left some Looks like he's about to offer me, offer me a trade. I want that casino. Ready to bring down the house, sugar? Yes! Yes! Handsome Jackpot is the first DLC release for Borderlands 3 and the next DLC we will be talking about. Moxie tells us about Handsome Jack's casino, and with him dead, who better than Moxie to take it over? We're introduced to one of Jack's body doubles in Timothy, and he really does add a lot to this DLC. We see a lot of classic movie heist tropes in this, but one of my favorites is the montage toward the end. I think it's super unique, and no other DLC has done anything similar. I really love fighting the many claptraps as well, as I've mentioned in the claptrap DLC in Borderlands 1. The blackjack loot chests were also a nice cherry on top in this gambling themed DLC, but let's get to the top 5 DLCs of the Borderlands franchise. He's holding together using spit and wishful thinking. She's barely staying in the air, let alone leaving the planet. Fight for Sanctuary was the last DLC added for Borderlands 2. This DLC takes place after the events of Borderlands 2 and has us defending Sanctuary from Dollcorp as they attempt to steal the Vault Key. This DLC nails almost 
everything, and if the DLCs above it didn't exist, it would be number one. It introduced us to a new rarity, a new raid boss, and it helped set up the story for Borderlands 3. This DLC served as a really nice bridge between old and new, and almost feels essential before stepping into Borderlands 3. Coming in at number four, we have Psycho Krieg and the Fantastic Fuster Cluck. In this add-on, Tannis has a step into the mind of Krieg in order to study how the Psychos of Pandora think. The amount of backstory and detail this DLC adds to a character who only shouts out random phrases at the top of his lungs is phenomenal. It makes me really feel for him and shows a side of Krieg we never would have known by interacting with him normally. Not only is the storyline good, the DLC's atmosphere is just absolutely insane. There are really no words to describe it. Hell, you fight a giant train as one of the bosses. This is one of those DLCs that has you questioning where the hell did we go wrong with the main story of Borderlands 3? Ah, the age source is real? Digital omnipotence, gimme gimme! Starting off our top 3, we have a DLC that I didn't even know existed before planning out this video. This is the only main DLC for Borderlands the pre-sequel. Since I knew nothing about this add-on, going into it completely blind was a wild experience. Handsome Jack has us dive into Claptrap's mind in order to retrieve the H source, powerful Hyperion information located deep in Claptrap's code. This DLC absolutely blew my expectations away. I wasn't expecting much as I didn't enjoy pre-sequel as a game, but oh my god. This was an absolute cinematic masterpiece. This DLC had so much character development for Claptrap, and the ending cutscene almost brought me to tears. It made me feel so much for him, and I'm so glad that I decided to make this video, because without this, I never would have discovered this masterpiece. So if it's that good, then why is it only number 3? Well honestly, I'd put the top 3 all at the same level. However, since I have to rank them in order, I'd put this in third just because I find these next two DLCs more fun to play through. Chef drew up a bounty of blood for any mean bastard crazy enough to take on the Devil Riders. In second place, we have Bounty of Blood. This Borderlands 3 DLC takes place on the planet of Gena. We discover a small town and help them fight off a gang of outlaws known as the Devil Riders, who want to take over the planet. This DLC has a unique atmosphere because it mixes Japanese and old school western, which worked out insanely well. I also enjoyed the characters added in this DLC, and the fights just felt great. There was a good mix of human and beast enemies, there were new gameplay changes like portals and core splorters, and even a brand new vehicle unique to this DLC. I couldn't get myself to stop playing this add-on, as it's just that damn good. The ending boss fight also has a unique mechanic with the teleports that just sets it apart from everything else. And the ending bank vault full of legendaries makes it feel like a real reward for saving the town. The only reason this DLC is second place and not in first is because the next one inspired a spin-off game, added detail to a well-known character in the franchise, and is overall one of the best DLCs ever created. And if you're a Borderlands fan, you already know which DLC I'm talking about. Shut the hell up, Morty! Tina? She's right, though. Shut up. To nobody's surprise, Tiny Tina's Dragon Keep is my number one DLC in 2024. If you haven't heard of this DLC before, then I'd genuinely be surprised, because the word perfection doesn't even describe how good this DLC is. Okay, okay, I'll stop glazing and explain why I believe it deserves this spot. Tina, Brick, Mordecai, and Lilith decide to play a game of Bunkers and Badasses, a tabletop game similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Tina, as the Bunker Master, narrates the DLC and tells the story of the adventure for our characters to go on. This DLC has everything you can ask for. Fun bosses, immersive environments, humor that holds up even years after this DLC was made, and a strong character development as Tina copes with the loss of Roland, who she looked up to as a father figure. Not only is the DLC's story great, the ending cutscene of everyone at Roland and Bloodwing's resting place just ties this whole game together. This was the only DLC where I wanted to go back and play every side quest, search every nook and cranny for secrets, and ultimately why I think it deserves the number one spot on this list. Do you agree or disagree with my list? If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like and subscribe. Also, if you want to see when we do these events live, make sure to drop a follow on the Twitch as well. Make sure to drink some food, eat some water, and have a great rest of your day.